thank you for the kind introduction and for the kind invitation to this conference, which at least has this non-Augustinian meritum that it is perfectly organized. When speaking about bodiliness, one probably will not spontaneously think of Augustine of Hippo, and if so, certainly not in the most positive way. In some milieus, it is easier to explain the, the Belgian political situation than the positive thoughts of Augustine on body, flesh, and sex. However, I think that for the issue under consideration, Augustine is probably the most interesting patristic author to be discussed. His impact on Western religious thought is well known. At the same time, there is no other, no other patristic author in the Latin West who has so often confessed his ignorance about himself and humanity. I do not think that he was the best candidate for the papacy. I am well aware that dealing with Augustine's view on the body is not an easy task. Indeed, one cannot separate his views on this specific issue from other aspects of his teaching. A complete presentation of Augustine's anthropology, so my Dr. Father van Bavel, would have to include his teaching on creation, freedom and sin, the relationship of body and soul, emotional life, desire and fear, interiority, epistemology, willing and loving, moral and social life, the image of God in man, and death. This caveat makes clear that it will be rather difficult to do justice to the whole of Augustine's reflections when focusing on one specific topic. Augustine always speaks of human beings within a Christian context. Our history has to do with creation by God, incarnation and salvation through Christ, and eternal life through resurrection. Augustine cannot think outside this box. As a result, when he reflects about human beings, this is always within a relational context in which the main task of human beings is to obey to God. In other words, Augustine never, never questions our dependence on God. He constantly emphasizes that the one who does not want to live in obedience to God is vitiated by pride and preparing his, her own doom. In this regard, it is worth to mention that Augustine in his works more than 2,000 times mentions the words superbia or superbus. This important idea of dependence will also have repercussions for Augustine's idea of ideas about the body. Indeed, just like the body, like the soul has to obey to God, of which it is the image, so the body has to obey to the soul. The Augustinian hierarchy is clear, God, soul, body. A hierarchy that, since the fall, no longer is harmonious, and it is this disturbance of the harmony that will be present in parts of Augustine's view on body and flesh. Augustine developed his ideas at a time that, at, at, least, at least with regard to bodiliness, one can speak of a period of transition. In ancient Roman culture, bodiliness and genderness were both very important. Indeed, still in the beginning of the 5th century, one could criticize people who tried to convince young married women not to have intercourse with their spouse. Pagan culture had highly esteemed the Geschlechtic Kite, as becomes clear in the fact that it had for all aspects, from the first longing to the full consummation, an own goddess. I do think that much of what Augustine says about 
body and sex should also be read and interpreted within the context of a culture that still held in high esteem these two. The Roman Empire of the beginning of the 5th century was under the influence of Christianity, but certainly not yet completely Christianized. Point two, the fundamental goodness of the body. In Augustine's impressive oeuvre, one can read time and again that the human body, corpus, is a gift of God, creator of all harmony, God, one truth, one salvation for all, the first and the highest essence, due to whom all that exists, insofar as it exists, deserves to be qualified as good. Reading Augustine about the human being, uh, about the human body, is first and foremost a reading of his constant praise of the Creator, the supreme artist, God. In De Civitate Dei, Augustine speaks of the body as a reference to God's creative activity. I quote, Moreover, even in the body, even here, what evidence we find of the goodness of God, of the providence of the mighty Creator, are not the sense organs and the other parts of that body, body so arranged and the form and shape and size of the whole body so designed as to show that it was made for the service of the rational soul. For example, the marvelous nibbleness which has been given to the tongue and the hands, fitting them to speak and write and execute so many duties and practice so many arts. Does this not prove that a body of this kind was designed as an adjunct to the soul. One is at loss to decide whether, in creating the body, greater regard was given to utility or to beauty. One is at loss to decide whether, in creating the body, greater regard was given to utility or to beauty. I leave out the, uh, the rest of the quote, for otherwise I fear some female attacks. Practical needs, of course, practical needs are, of course, transitory. And the time will come when we, will, when we shall enjoy one another's beauty for itself alone without any lust. It is suggested that in all patristic literature, no father of the church wrote so admiringly of the human body as Augustine did. Augustine often praises the beauty of the body and dote with form. The human body is worth to be loved and cared for. Augustine can speak at length and in a very detailed way about the beauty of the body, the way in which it is structured and functions, serving our will. Although the body belongs to the lowest of the created good elements, it deserves to be qualified as beautiful in its own right, for it is held together by form and species. Human beings, human beings' bodies deserve, without reservation, qualifications such as good, harmonious, at least in case the souls love God their master. Again a proof that Augustine's admiration for and appreciation of the body must be read within a theological context. It belongs to our Christian faith that we praise our body even in its current status, where it aggravates our soul because of sin. Indeed, when we consider all things well, we are amazed about its species, the order of the members, the distinction of the senses, the erect stature, and many other things. Our body is much nearer and familiar to us than clothes. That's something you can easily understand when you're walking these days through Vienna. 
in the warmth of Yemen. Our body is much nearer and familiar to us than clothes, while the latter can be of help, they are not of help today, while the latter can be of help or function as an ornament, as in my case, the body belongs to the essence of human beings' nature. Between the two, there exists a lovely partnership, a kind of marriage, a sweet friendship that is such that we all, although knowing that we have to die, try to postpone the separation between the two. Augustine rejects the idea that we hold into contempt the body of death, especially those of the faithful, and just for their bodies have been the instrument of the Holy Spirit when realizing all good works. What people do becomes visible through concrete bodily acts. The body deserves our care even in case it is dead. Care for the body is not something which is typical of Christians, but it is also present among those who do not believe in the resurrection. But Christians must take more care of the dead body because they believe in its resurrection and eternal life. The Christian care for the dead body is a proof of their belief in its eternal life. 3. Body and soul, soul and body. When Augustine speaks about a human being, he thinks of a being possessing body and soul. According to Augustine, soul and body together define the essence of a human being. One can only fully speak of a human being in case there are both body and soul, the body clinging together with the soul. In opposition to some pagan philosophers, Augustine rejects the idea that one can separate the body from the essence of the human nature, although admitting that the body is inferior to the soul, just like the soul is inferior to God. In one of his later works, Augustine will explicitly state that the one who wants to separate the body from the human nature should be qualified as a fool. I insist on the fact that Augustine describes the hierarchy between body and soul in theological terms. The hierarchical order starts with God, then the soul, then the body. In other words, Augustine can only speak of body and soul within a context of the divine. Body and soul are certainly different in nature, the soul being superior to the body, but they are not foreign to each other, the soul as rational substance ruling the body. With regard to the soul, I do not discuss in details the distinction Augustine makes, and I will go over to line 120 for the translators. As I will discuss later, the problem Augustine has with carnal concupiscence has much more to do with the soul than with the body. 4. Body and flesh. When speaking about the body, Augustine uses concepts such as corpus and caro. In se, both are good. However, caro, equivalent of the Greek sarx, is often related to corruption to concupiscentia. Augustine admits of course, that the creation of the flesh is God's work, but immediately adds that this flesh is corrupted, that it has to do with temptations. When flesh is used as synonymous with the body, it regularly has a negative connotation, and it is striking that in such cases, Paul is not far away. Caro is identified with the corpus mortis, of Romans 7.24. Flesh has to do with this body of death, not so much with the body as such. Augustine clearly wants to distinguish between body neutral and flesh in a negative way. Every flesh is body, but not every body is flesh. In essence, flesh or body of death are constantly related to evil, to fallen nature, 
to the absence of being, not to the being as such. No wonder that Augustine's image of flesh, flesh as prism resonates the Platonic idea of the Soma Sema doctrine. Let it be with this nuance that the flesh in se remains good, for all beings are created by God. The exact relation between body and soul has been, for Augustine, throughout his life, a mystery of, if not a problem. In his last work, Opus Imperfectum, when dealing about the origin of the soul, he ends his argument with the conclusion, Nescio, I don't know it. One can easily collect a series of texts that, makes, that make clear that the body aggravates the soul and that the soul is imprisoned in the body and the like. However, at the end of the day, the rational human being is the problem, not the body. It is the rational human being that sinned, as became clear in the story of Adam and Eve. It is the rational human being that continues to sin when being drunk, when eating too much, when using violence, and you can add all the, all the examples of this morning, you can also find them in Augustine, nihil novi sub sole. Throughout his life, Augustine refuses to qualify the body as a malum. Evil is the result of a personal choice of a human being. The flesh in itself can never be called an evil. When Paul speaks about the flesh, he also has in mind the human being. The same is true of Augustine. Augustine rejects the idea that one excuses our flesh because of sins and vices. For our flesh, created by God, is both in its nature and all the good. The one who suggests that the flesh is the cause of all evil behavior does not sufficiently take into account the human nature as such, a clear critique of the Manichaean dualism. Augustine also disagrees with the Stoic depreciation of concupiscible and irascible appetites. One must regulate them, not extirpate, for indeed Christ himself showed emotions as became clear when he wept because of the death of Lazarus. Although Augustine highly esteemed the Platonic philosophy, it is exactly on this point that he rejects their negative view on the flesh. The one who suggests that all evil for the soul comes from the body errs. The Platonic idea that our desire, fear, joy and sadness come from our body and all the cause of all sins and vices is not in concordance with the Christian faith. The corruption of the body that aggravates the soul is not the cause of the first sin, but its punishment. It was the sinning soul that made the flesh corrupted. Augustine thus insists that one must put the blame on both body and soul. It is the human being, not on the body alone. Also, bodiless beings such as the devil and the fallen angels the so-called hell's angels, can sin. In this regard, Augustine insists that what one feels of desire or pain is always related to the soul. When we say that the flesh experiences desire or suffers pain, we or some part of our soul are affected by what the flesh experiences. A quote, the pain of the flesh is nothing but a distress of the soul arising from the flesh, and a kind of a disagreement with what the body is suffering. For Augustine, feelings such as fear belong to the soul, not to the flesh. Feelings such as pleasure, hunger, thirst, or lust are preceded by a kind of appetite we feel in the body, but we experience these things as our own desires. In other words, all what the body experiences is a human experience, the whole body being, in, the whole being, being involved in it. For Augustine, 
the body is certainly not the enemy of the soul, a, a, a substance that must be separated from the soul. The Augustine of the Pelagian controversy is often described as a pessimistic old man. However, in the debate with Julian of Eclanum, this Augustine insists that the human being, the human nature is worth to be healed because it possesses evil, not because it is evil. Our nature is vitiated, but isn't a vice. This is not merely lip service because of a polemical context. Augustine, time and again, insists on the fact that Christians believe in the resurrection of the body, and in this regard, the distance between Augustine and Porphyry is enormous and significant. While for Augustine, Christ, is be Christ becoming man is both a proof of the goodness of the body and an invitation to humility, Porphyry's idea, at least as, at least as presented by Augustine, is well known, omne corpus figiendum est. Indeed, what Porphyry misses, according to Augustus, uh, Augustine, what Porphyry misses when rejecting the idea of a bodily resurrection is precisely the humility of God who became man. And indeed, for Augustine, once our flesh will be our dear friend throughout eternity, it is when our last enemy, death, will be taken away. For Augustine, there exists a sweet consortium between body and soul. In my view, it is therefore a bit too easy to suggest that Augustine remained a neo-Platonic dualistic thinker. As is said, there is a hierarchical order between body and soul, but at the end of the day, their unity is more important than their differences. And now we go over to the hot topic of sexuality. When Augustine converted to Orthodox Christianity, it should be reminded that Manichaeism, as present in North Africa, deserved to be qualified as a Christian sect. And in quite a number of its teachings, important elements of the Christian faith about Christ were present. When Augustine converted to Orthodox Christianity, he gave up sex. In a sense, there is an inner relation between his conversion and his lifelong choice for chastity, a decision he took after a long struggle. During 13 years, he had a monogamous relation with a concubine, something that often happened in Christian and pagan milieus at the time, and was accepted by Christians. When the concubine was sent away by Augustine's mother Monica, she remained faithful to him and never would have sex with another man, while Augustine took another mistress. He could not yet marry with the girl with whom a marriage was arranged, for she was only 11 20, uh, 11, 12 years old, Augustine at the time being 31. He needed a mistress, for he was not able to live without sex. <clears throat> when longing for a life in chastity and continence, he prayed to receive this charisma, but not immediately. Whether such prayer is to be dated before or during his Manichaean period, is a matter of discussion. Once Augustine had taken the decision to convert and to give up sex, he avoided to meet women alone. Every possible stimulus of sexual relations seemed to be a danger, both for him and his monks. As a bishop, Augustine considered friendship, not sexuality, as the essence of marriage. Sexuality was considered as an evil married people could make good use of. As part of the concupiscentia carnis, it was a result of the fall and the stimulus for sinning. 
especially in the controversy with the once married Julian of Eclanum, for whom sexuality was seemingly never experienced as a problem, Augustine repeated time and again that sexuality was an evil. Julian of Eclanum, of Eclanum radically opted for the goodness of creator and creation. Julian was a nuanced defender of the goodness of sexuality. For Julian, concupiscence belonged to the human nature as created by God. It was necessary for the procreation, a mission given by God to humanity, and this from its very beginning. Concupiscence, according to Julian, therefore deserved the qualification good, let it be a mediocre good, not a manium aliquot bonum. It was an instrument needed for procreation, a concrete manifestation of concupiscence in its diversity. It is a feeling inherent to our bodily nature, a sense of the flesh as created by God. It was a good insofar as it was used within the legitimate, legitimate framework of marriage in view of procreation. Apart from the qualification good for concupiscence, Julian in fact held exactly the same positions as Augustine. However, this Italian aristocrat had never been troubled by the dark Augustinian concupiscence. Julian was of the opinion that a disciplined Christian, gifted by freedom, could control and direct sexuality. He did so not, as is often suggested, not because he was an arrogant man, but because he believed that God had created human beings as responsible beings, gifted with a free will, able to do what was ordered by God, for God himself had created humanity in such a way that it was well equipped to meet God's requirements and avoid sin. Augustine could not accept that since the fall, concupiscentia carnis could ever receive the predicate good. A concupiscence had become an intrinsic feature of the mortal flesh. It caused, just like fear for the death, unrest. Both were a convincing proof of the ravage as caused by the fall of the first human beings. For Augustine, carnal concupiscence as such was considered an evil. And the married couple was allowed to make use of this evil only, only with view of procreation. It might well be that in case Julian had not urged Augustine to dispute with him, Augustine's view on sexuality would have been evaluated in another way than is the case today. One of the key issues in the debate between Augustine and Julian was the moral status of carnal concupiscence, quite often sexual concupiscence. Indeed, 65% of the places where one will find this concept are in the works Augustine wrote against the Bishop of Eichlan. In the works against the same Pelagians, the concept never appears. In Augustine's impressive series of sermons, uh, of sermons, Concupiscentia Carnis only shows up 69 times. More than 800 sermons are preserved. Only 69 times we will find the term Concupiscentia Carnis. In other words, in other words, it might well be that Augustine's depreciation of sex is too much influenced by the controversy with Julian of a clan, something that is quite often overlooked in recent literature. Because of Julian, Augustine did a lot of efforts to distinguish between concupiscence and marriage, making a distinction between the two and reducing the essence of marriage to procreation. For Augustine, it belongs to the human being's natural desires that they want to marry and have children. And there's nothing wrong with that. It is a desire that is compared with the desire to have good health or nourish and educate his, her own children, 
Those of you who don't like this quite positive view, I invite to read Jerome, or eventually Ambrose de Virginitate. It's the best book you can read if you think, if you intend to marry. You will immediately forget it. This was not a case for sexuality. For this position, for his position, Augustine was of the opinion that both Old and New Testament stood at his side. A literal reading, I'm not sure that he is correct for the New Testament, that's clear. A, a literal reading of the Genesis story, Genesis story was of great help, both on the level of the fall and its consequences. Time and again, Augustine was speaking of an antinomy between flesh and spirit. An antinomy he put on the level of the disordered soul and Paul's wretched eye. Paul's wretched eye was of great help indeed for the explanation of this disorder. Indications that something was wrong, wrong with this carnal concupiscence were the experience of confusion and shame. Self-control, something Julian never had problems with, was considered to be a challenge and a problem. Carnal desire was described as a just punishment of the sinners who, through their deep disobedience to God, had disrupted the natural order. Such positions perfectly fitted in the trends of the time. Growing ascetism, spread of monastic communities, preference of chastity and continence over marriage. They were present in the works in the work of predecessors like Ambrose and Jerome. Moreover, given the fact that procreation was considered in Roman society as the essence of marriage, the Christian community was probably not that much shocked by Augustine's idea. Think of the case of Cato. Augustine was quite convinced that the ideal Christian couple would grow in its attempts to overcome the sexual desire as the years would pass by and the sexual concupiscence decline. Augustine, Augustine's view was, rece was perceived by the generations to come. Julian of Aiklanum, probably the last patristic defender of the relative goodness of concupiscence was condemned, and at least in the Roman Catholic world, world it took another 1,500 years or so in order to discover and reluctantly accept the eventual goodness of sexuality within the context of marriage. That this recognition either came too late or was no longer considered as relevant in the daily life of human beings has been made clear during the last 50 years, at least in this part of the world. Thank you.